Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Back with a set of deep space updates. That is space news from the last week, which generally doesn't deserve a video of its own. Although, strangely, this week we, well, at this time, again, we start with uh, the launches of the week. And the very first thing was something that got a video of its own. Astra's attempt to launch NASA, NASA's uh, Tropics mission. So this is uh, a set of three launches that Astra were going to be carrying out for NASA. Uh, each space launch would carry two satellites into their own orbital plane, and between the three orbital planes, these things would provide continuous coverage of hurricanes, you know, within a certain range. Unfortunately, this launch did not go according to plan. Uh, it looks like they were working excellently all the way through the boost phase, through space, space, stage separation, and uh, they got to about 6.5 kilometers per second, and then the engine shut down. So the spacecraft ended up falling probably just short of Africa, and yeah, the mission is lost. At this point, we don't know what happened. We, it's been about, a well, it's been almost over a week, and we still haven't heard any more updates on this, as far as I can tell. Um, yeah, NASA's obviously wanting an investigation before it launches steps two and three of that mission. On the 17th of June, or even starting on the 17th of June, we had SpaceX launch a Palooza. We had three Falcon 9 launches within 36 hours. And we started out with a Starlink launch from the East Coast. And this was notable because it was the 13th flight of this particular booster. Um, at this point now, by the way, SpaceX has now surpassed 100 relaunched rockets. So, yeah, going a long way from the skeptics that said it couldn't be done and the skeptics that said it couldn't be profitable. Now it's just there you know, churning out launches, reusing launch vehicles, a rapid cadence. Uh, less than a day later, there was a Falcon 9 launching uh, a, a spacecraft called SARA, or SARA, from uh, Vandenberg Space Force Base. So this is, SARA is a synthetic aperture radar spacecraft, and it's a constellation of three that's run by the German, uh, you know, military German Department of Defense. They are replacing a previous constellation which had five of these satellites that were launched on Soyuz. So I, I saw that through the binoculars, couldn't get it on camera. Uh, 19th of June, again, less than 36 hours later, I'll let you know, between the three of these, there was a very, very much a talked about launch, which we know was carrying a spacecraft called Global Star FM 15. And this was. Well, so Global Star was a constellation that had already flown, I think it was three launches of six satellites on Soyuz. We know that this was carrying one spacecraft, and we knew from some other comment that there was some secret launch going to happen. And since there was no other thing on the calendar, everyone figured out that there was some other payloads on this rocket that weren't being talked about. So... The Global Star satellites are about 700 kilograms, but the Falcon 9 was going to have to land on a barge for performance reasons. Normally, with a payload that small, you wouldn't need to do a barge return. It turns out that after it launched, there was no launch, so no views of the second stage or the, the fairing release or anything like that. Spacecraft did a couple of burns. And then we got footage back. Then we got images back from the thing and we saw the little uh, Global Star satellite on the side. We saw it get deployed. So yes, we don't know what, what that was all about. We do know that since then, four satellites have been found in orbit. So it was clearly used as a cover for a launch of military stuff with some classified uh, payloads. We don't know what they are, what they could be. Um, and we don't know why this would happen on... <laughs> as a ride share with Global Star. That's that's one of the weirder parts, to be honest, right? Having a classified payload as a ride share with a commercial, something that was so unclassified that it was allowed to fly on Soyuz previously. Anyway, yeah. So yeah, big deal was SpaceX launching stuff really fast. You know, good job. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the first time we've seen anything of this cadence since the days of you know, launching ballistic missiles, but it was pretty cool. Obviously, in the last 10 days, the other big news for SpaceX has been the the sort of finding of no significant influ uh, whatever, impact with, with uh, mitigations that are being required for SpaceX's Boca Chica site. This is a series of 75 measures that are have been agreed between SpaceX and the affected parties. 
This is not something that was totally, you know, came out of the imagination of someone at the FAA. Uh, watching the response to this, I see a lot of people being really angry and a lot of people being really angry because some people really wanted, the, <laughs> wanted this bad. Some people want, think that SpaceX having to do, having to agree to anything is just below them. Uh, I, I think the fact is that you got a lot of reasonable people saying, yep, this seems reasonable. And then you've got angry people on both sides. That's probably a sign that this agreement is right in the middle of what's required. So anyway, Boca Chica will be moving forward. We could see, I mean, according to Elon, we could see a launch in July, which probably means September. Yeah, you know, Elon time. We all love it. Anyway, um, as for the other you know, company that's building spacecraft for people, uh, Boeing, that we've now got uh, with Starliner, the first crewed launch, has had a change of its crew. We're going to have Sunita Williams and Butch Wilmore be getting assigned to the Starliner uh, for the crewed flight test. Now, originally, Sunita Williams was assigned to the first operational mission for Starliner. Now she's been brought forward to the flight test. If you remember, there was also a Nicole Mann. She was going to fly on that, but then she got uh, taken off that and put on an actual SpaceX flight. Uh, or she's going to be flying on Crew-5. And Mike Fink, I'm not sure what his status is, but he, he was on there at one point, isn't there right now. And I guess, finally... SLS completed its wet dress rehearsal, although not without some problems here and there. So they actually managed to fuel the rocket all the way up both stages. They have all the hypergolics, all the cryogenics, but yeah, they had some problems, uh, mostly with ground service equipment. They had hydrogen leaks, which uh, uh, caused them some you know, caused them some delays, and they only got their counter down to something like T minus twenty nine seconds before some computer called a halt to the launch. So they're obviously detanking this. They're now going to go through their problems, figure out what they can fix and decide whether they think they've solved enough stuff to go forward with an actual launch or another wet dress rehearsal. There is a limit to how many times they can do this. There's like a, a limit on how many times they can fill this tank and then drain the tank because every time you fill it, you know, you're basically causing the tank to stretch a little and then when you you know, detank it, it stretches in a different way. And that's something that, that can you know, generate strain, it can generate damage. And so there's concerns over how much they can do this. Um, I mean, look, to be clear, having a hydrogen leak in your ground service equipment when you're launching a vehicle isn't some sign that SLS is, again, a terrible, messy project. There's many other signs of that. I mean, look, Apollo 11 had a hydrogen leak in ground service equipment as it was getting ready to launch, and they made it all to the moon, right? Hydrogen is just really hard to work with. It's just this one, the slippery little molecule that wants to go through every little gap and ruin your day. So anyway, that is a big step forward. We'll see where that goes. We also got this really cool photo from Maxar, from a spy satellite, you know, Earth observation satellite, showing this thing on the pad that was stunning. Uh, another cool bit of footage released in the last couple of days is a, from a camera which was attached to the fairing of a Soyuz. And, you know, we've seen fairing cameras from SpaceX, and they were, of course, you, were using this to investigate how they recovered their fairings. This appears to be nothing of the sort. This just appears to be uh, attaching a camera and watch the fairing disintegrate as it hits the Earth's atmosphere. I'm not sure Russia is interested in going after fairing recovery, but maybe I'm misunderstanding. Still, it is pretty amazing to watch this thing get torn up and land out in the middle of nowhere so it can get recovered. Other cool images that came out of NASA this week was uh, an image of some trash on Mars from Perseverance. The basically Perseverance found this shiny object and when they zoomed in on it, they realized it was a bit of foil from the descent stage. You know, the descent stage that dropped the sky, you know, dropped this uh, rover onto the surface and then flew away. Now, this descent stage crashed two kilometers away. So now there's a question, how did this foil get all the way? I mean, presumably it's light enough to get blown about, but, you know, are we spreading like glitter all over the surface of Mars. Yeah, interesting. Anyway, uh, and China, boy, so China, shots fired, was the, the, how I saw it. China has announced that they are planning a Mars sample return mission to launch in 2029 with 
return in 2031. Now, their, their mission is a whole lot simpler than what NASA and Europe are proposing. NASA and Europe have obviously already got their rover on the surface collecting samples and being very careful to get the really good ones. But their whole return process won't bring the samples back until 2033 at the earliest. And that means that they could get beaten by China, albeit with uh, samples of lower scientific value. But there is a lot of, obviously, prestige in coming first. It'll be interesting to see if there's any reaction from uh, you know, Europe or the US. And of course, you know, it's entirely possible that this gets bumped on their side. They are... They, basically, the timing of this means that they would have to be doing a lot of their sample collection and caching during times when there's a high probability of global dust storms. So it's entirely possible it just isn't going to work. Also, staying with China, there was some news stories. This, well, there was a couple of news stories. First was uh, some imagery that came down showing uh, explosions that had happened at a, at the, I think it was Jihuan launch site possibly related to the development of solid rocket motors. Uh, these are satellite photos from like October last year showing obvious uh, damage to test stands and things like that. Like, it's felt that right now China is really spending some effort trying to get their solid rocket motors, uh, you know, solid rocket motor based rockets much more capable and they're having some test failures as a result. Um, also, their Xi'an 12, which was pair of satellites which were launched into geostationary orbit with, you know, we weren't really sure what they were going to do, but it was very clear once they started maneuvering that they were interested in, you know, investigating other satellites. There was a sort of cool animation released by a private company that monitors, you know, Earth orbit showing the, the USA 7, uh, 270 satellite, which we also know inspects other satellites, trying to go in and get a close look at these two satellites. And then the, the two satellite, two Chinese satellites going in different directions. So you can, yeah, you can't chase us both, right? Uh, I expect they're shooting pictures at each other. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a game of cat and mouse with uh, both sides saying, cheese. Okay, maybe that doesn't work. Anyway. Uh, what else? Outside outside Earth orbit, we have the James Webb Space Telescope continuing its uh, commissioning, going through calibrating all its different sensor modes. And I think the most interesting thing to mention this time was the they released the first spectra from the MIRI, the Mid Infrared Instrument. So this is a spectra in the range of about nine point four to ten uh, micrometers, and they compare it to the spectra that they would get from Spitzer. You can see there's just way more resolution in this. This is going to be, you know, a big step up from what we previously had. Uh, the, you know, they're also aligning their images uh, and other stuff right now. But, you know, we're looking forward. It's like a month from now. We're going to get the first actual official, fully curated, awesome images from this thing. And uh, I'm glad that everything seems to be working out. Finally, a truly jaw-dropping piece of video was released from Blue Origin from tests and development of their BE-4 engine. Specifically, this shows the ignition of the pre-burner, which is the thing that feeds the initial turbo pumps or drives the initial turbines. And this is, you know, this is basically lighting it. And you've got to think, this is something that happens in a fraction of a second. And they want to see the sort of where, like, what kind of transient events are happening. So they show this ignition really high frame rate. You can see the flames moving around. You can see like pressure waves inside this thing. It, it's amazing that we can see this. It is absolutely a thing of beauty. And I, I hope that we finally get the engines actually operating on a rocket very, very soon. So yeah, that's my uh, deep space updates. Uh, let me know if you've got any other things that I should be covering because uh, you don't always miss something. Glad you tuned in. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>